we are again. What's going on here? It's the physics video lecture. Physics 2A video lecture 43. And it's on oscillations. Oscillations. So I brought along a bunch of oscillating systems here. That's a bit confusing. We're going to have to take them all one by one. So let's do that briefly. We have a lot to do today. Uh, then I'll review the old quiz that I had a lot of questions on. So we have different systems, some wilder than others, and oscillations are periodic repeating motions. So taking them one at a time, the pendulum, very important. I think we talked about the grandfather clock early on in the semester very important for keeping time. Okay, so that's a fundamental object of study. Then we have masses on springs. Now this one has a literally a certain twist to it because as it moves up and down, it starts to twist. And if you follow that motion for a moment, about three more seconds and the vertical motion will have completely stopped, which is to say right now and now it's just twisting so there's a twisting motion or a vertical motion let's stop that one here's another pendulum okay humble but a really important object of study just as that one was this is a lot wilder and goes beyond what we can understand today but we can demonstrate it it's a double pendulum. Those motions can hardly be predicted. Okay. Good, so there's the double pendulum. We'll also talk about these pendula. These are masses on a, on a metal spoke and they just oscillate back and forth. But you'll notice there's a certain speed. This one a lot faster. All of these motions are fundamentally the same. So I'm going to set up the system that we have to study really thoroughly. They're all fundamentally doing the same with the same thing with the exception of this one. This one gets a little more interest to it. But good, I'll set this one up. We'll ponder it while I remove these demonstrations. So we're left with the object that we want to study, and I can even take this off so we're not distracted by that. So all of these repeating motions were the same. This one here, we're going to study in great detail, masses, springs, okay? So before we get to that, and so before we study this subject oscillations in depth, I want to review one of the homework, uh, not homework problems, the quiz. Had a lot of questions about the quiz. This was calorimetry. So let's just call this review before we move on here. Calorimetry. Our problem was to dump a piece of ice into a bucket of water and find the equilibrium temperature. So we had a chunk of ice, I'll say with mass M, and we have a bucket of water, capital M, and we're gonna put this thing in here, and then, since it's a calorimetry problem, we imagine it's enclosed so that no energy comes in, no energy escapes. Okay. So the way I like to do this is QM as it was ice, because the ice has to melt, plus QM was water, 
plus QW equals zero. All three of these energy amounts add up to zero because we're going to melt the ice, we're going to warm up the water that was the ice, and that's actually all going to come from the water in the bucket. So the water has to be hot enough to melt the ice completely. And when I chose the numbers for the quiz, I made sure that was going to work. So here's what we have. We can just write this down. Mass of the ice, latent heat of fusion of water. So of the ice, that's that energy. Plus mass of the ice, but now it's been melted, specific heat of water. And then T minus zero degrees Celsius. I don't have to write that zero in, but I am, okay? I'm gonna write it in. So the, the ice was at zero degrees Celsius. So we just had to melt it. That's its mass times its latent heat of fusion. And then we're going to add mass of the water, specific heat of water, T minus the initial temperature of water equals zero. So we do that once more with these letters here. So we have mass, latent heat of fusion, plus that mass, specific heat of water, T minus zero degrees Celsius, plus mass of water, which I called capital M, specific heat of water, T minus T water equals zero. Same equation, I'll put a box around it. Okay. And you have to be able to write this equation down. Once you have this, you're looking at that final temperature T here. This is what we're solving for. So solve for T. And in a problem like this, you don't want to plug any numbers in until you have your final formula. These masses were given to you, and this initial temperature was also given, and we're solving for that T right there. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave it right at that, okay? Because you just multiply this out, this zero is not going to do anything, it's zero and you'll have N specific heat of water plus capital M specific water times T is equal to everything else on the right side. Mass specific heat of water times TW on the right side. Subtract off this, divide by the, you know, the common factor. So that's set up adequately, solve for Temperature. Okay, that's a good calorimetry problem. So now we're going to come back to oscillations. Yeah. Back to oscillations. So, of course, showing you all the demonstrations at once is kind of colorful, but Confusing. This one we're going to focus on now. But first, I'll go ahead and define, put a couple definitions up regarding periodic motion and oscillations. So we're talking about oscillations. What's our chapter called? Vibrations and waves. So this, we're in chapter 13. Vibrations and waves, and we're talking about oscillations here. That's what they mean right there. Waves we'll do next time. Okay, so the first thing we have to talk about is periodic motion. So that's motion that repeats itself, and periodic refers to the time it takes for one complete cycle. Repeating motion, period T equals time 
of one oscillation. Time of one oscillation. Then there is another quantity, so I'll go ahead and underline this, this is important here, period. And then there's the concept of frequency. Frequency F is just one divided by this period P. So here we have the unit of time is just going to be the second. Okay, so we're not calling it tension right here. Okay, this is time, time period. We've had that before when we were talking about orbits and other things. And the frequency, unit of frequency, which is apparently one over seconds by this definition, is called the hertz. Okay, HZ for hertz. And what is this? This is the time of one oscillation. This is the number of oscillations per second equals the number of oscillations per unit time, or I'll, since unit time is a second per second. That's the first thing we're dealing with, periodic motion. All of these demos I had here on the table were doing just that. They were repeating themselves. So the second thing I want to do is give an example that is different than these oscillations here. But it would be a repeating motion with a period and a frequency. And that would be just a bouncing ball. Suppose you have an ideal bouncing ball. Bouncing on this table, it bounces exactly as high as you, the height you dropped it from, and it just bounces indefinitely. Okay. The reason this one's kind of interesting to study, this is the bouncing ball, we'll just call the x-axis the height, the t-axis here. It's interesting to study because we know about free fall. So if we drop it here from height h, you know, we've learned that we've got this parabola, but it's an ideal bouncing ball. So it's going to bounce up, come back down again. And it's ideal, so it's going to repeat itself and never lose any ample, any height. Okay. So those are all supposed to be exactly the same height. So then we would say that amplitude is h and the period is for a complete repetition, so here, let's get another color. We'll have period T like that, and we'll also say that the height here we call the amplitude is H. Okay. Now, we're done with this. We saw the time of the repetitions, and we've got this new expression, amplitude for the height. It's hard to read. Okay. Amplitude. But this is very different than these kind of smooth motions here. Okay. So this gives us an example for these concepts, but it is not this type of smooth periodic motion of a mass on a spring which, that we're going to study. Good, so I'm just going to leave that as that example. And now we're going to go to the study of this mass on the spring. Now when I draw this on the board, I'm only going to have one spring that compresses and stretches. But here in the lab, we have two springs that don't really compress, they just stretch. Okay. Um, but here's the interesting demonstration. The springs remain unchanged. And so it oscillates back and forth. Now I add some mass. Same type of oscillation, but clearly slower. So the period has increased. The time for oscillation has increased. I'm going to drop even more mass on it. And the period even increases more. So when the period increases, 
period increases, since it's the denominator here, the frequency decreases, right? They just have that inverse relationship. And that expression amplitude I just talked about, if this is equilibrium, I can pull this out to say the distance of this blue pen here. Provided it doesn't roll away, all right. So then the amplitude of this oscillation is that distance that I pulled it. And put one on both sides. Here we go, this should work. That's good. Okay. So that would be twice the amplitude, because it's amplitude on one side, amplitude on the other. Now this real system has friction in it, and so it's actually going to come to rest. An ideal system with no friction would just oscillate back and forth forever. Okay. So we have period, frequency, and uh, I'll just put amplitude. as these three concepts that we have to understand. Period, frequency, amplitude. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is set this, this, this scenario up uh, mathematically. So we can get rid of these things. Now this motion that's exemplified by either a pendulum or a mass on a spring has very specific mathematical properties. And it gets a special name, it's called harmonic motion. And uh, we'll characterize that. So now we're doing the oscillations. So now consider, now consider the following scenario. We have A spring. So we talked about these springs this semester. It's got a spring constant K. It's hooked up to this bar of mass M. And you know what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put that X equals zero right here. So when I pull this car out, as it's pulled out a bit right now, and if I let go, going to move to the left and uh, we'll go ahead and imagine that we released it from x equals a for amplitude and it's oscillating back and forth right now it's centered on x equals zero so it's either moving to the left or moving to the right um, or if I just started this way and didn't touch it, then it's there at x equals zero, it's in equilibrium. So this is the mass M on the spring K. And uh, that vertical os oscillator I showed you a little while ago is really gonna obey pretty much exactly the same mathematics that we're gonna do here. So this is the x axis in meters. So what do we know about a spring here? Since we're gonna talk about that motion. We know that that uh, potential energy U of the spring is one half K X squared. So if I pull this car out to X equals A and hold it and then release it from rest, the total energy in the car will be one half k a squared. Okay. So we know that u sub springs and if we release the car from rest at x equals a comma then energy will be equal to one half k a squared. 
which will be the work that's been stored in the spring. Okay, right, one half K A squared. So I number these things. Well, we'll see, it's an important point. We'll put it in a red box. So next we're going to use conservation of energy and figure out the speed of this car as it oscillates back and forth. Yeah, this isn't really drawn as an oscillation, so you know, I'll just put this arrow, right? It's oscillating back and forth. Map them on the spring K, oscillates. That's our demonstration. Okay, so next. start at rest, right? So at rest it's one half k a squared, and when it's in motion it's one half m b squared plus one half k x squared. Okay. So this is my conservation of energy equation. The total energy equals kinetic energy plus potential energy. Let's go ahead and write that down. P equals kinetic energy plus potential energy. So this equation allows us to solve for V. And I'm going to use one board today, so I'm going to have to erase everything. But we're going to solve for V. And that's our next step. Good. So one, two, three, I'll call that four. cancel everywhere. We have Ka squared equals mv squared uh, plus Kx squared. So we'll do this in two steps. We'll have mv squared equals Ka squared minus x squared. V equals plus minus square root K over m square root a squared minus x squared. So there's our speed of our oscillating mass. We got that from conservation of energy. What we're trying to find now We want to find the motion of the system, and we already have the velocity. Okay. Now, generally, we have to use calculus to find the motion of this particular system, but we have a way around that that we're going to pursue here. So, so next, find, find the motion of the mass, i.e., we want to find x of t, question mark. What is the position as a function of time? That's our goal. What we have there, we have already used energy conservation. Of course, we have Newton's law of motion. Newton's law, and that's mass times acceleration is equal to force and mass 
times acceleration is therefore equal to k times x. This is Hooke's law. I could call it the law of the spring. And I think we talked about that earlier in the semester, but I'm going to do a little reminder of that. So this is the equation of motion, and generally we would need calculus to solve because this is a differential equation, a very famous one. Um, in fact, just so you see it, some of you have had calculus, maybe all of you, it's the mass times the second time derivative equals minus k times x. And we're, like I said, we're going to work through this our own way. Let me go ahead and draw Hooke's Law right here. So the force, absolute value of x is just a straight line. And the, in the differential equation, it's negative because it's a restoring force. Go ahead and put that here. Minus sign is a restoring force. Right? You pull on it, it pulls back. You push on it, it pushes back. So it's a restoring force. And yeah, it's linear. And I think when we did this a few, you know, been a month or two. Um, we saw that the spring constant here is just the slope of this graph if you actually measure it. So k is the slope, and the units of k were newtons per meter. So we have that. OK, so the technique we're going to use to get all of this here, we already know the velocity, um, but in order to get the law of motion here, or solve the law of motion, and get the actual expression for the motion, we have to take a detour to uniform circular motion. I have to erase all of these things. Four, five, six, yeah, the numbering's gonna come in handy, five, six, seven. So next, we're gonna talk about uniform circular motion. about this harmonic motion, and I'm going to prove this for you, it's called harmonic motion, it turns out that this is the projection of uniform circular motion down onto the x-axis. So the way I can show this, it'll all come together, we start with a circle centered on the origin, there's x, there's y, there was our point, you know, there's our point mass, m. And we're going to go ahead and use a as the radius of this circle. So this mass is going uniformly counterclockwise. That's a theta. And the projection onto the projection of this onto the x-axis, so in fact, let's draw our axes out to the left as well. The projection on the x-axis as this thing goes around counterclockwise is just from trig a cos theta. Okay. So x, you know, there's an x and a y component. So what we have here is, yeah, I need a little more room. We have x equals a cosine of theta. And theta is just equal to omega times t. So I have to explain this a bit. Remember we had uniform circular motion. So we know that 
uh, theta equals omega t would be for constant rotational motion, for instance. So we know this formula, and we're now going to plug it in here so that x equals a cosine omega t. That's uniform circular motion projected down onto the x-axis. So we have that. We also know that omega times t is equal to 2 pi, where t is the period of motion, because if we take omega, omega times 2 pi here, then we've gone in a complete circle, 2 theta, 2 pi theta, okay? So omega times capital T is equal to 2 pi. So we have that. So I'll get an 8 point here. What about the speed of uniform circular motion? The speed of uniform circular motion we have V is simply, is simply omega R. That was our general formula. Here, V is equal to omega times A, because that's the radius of our circle. Or V is equal to 2 pi over T times A. We can use either of these. Omega or this value right here. So my next point is the question, what is V sub X? You know, V would be a vector tangential to the motion like that. What is its projection? The projection of V onto the X axis. So what is V sub X equal to? And here we get something great because we know this and the formula that I just had and erased, I'll put back up here. So this is our question. What is V sub X equal to? And that's going to bring all of these points together. So I have to erase and I'll take this off now. We had that expression for v sub x. Let's uh, get my numbers going here. Yeah. Remember, v sub x was plus minus root k over m a squared minus x squared. That was from conservation of energy. Now we're ready. A over M, A squared minus this X squared plugged in. Okay. A squared minus A squared cosine squared omega T. But you guys probably remember, if you pull the A squared out, we'll have one minus cosine squared, which is sine squared. So that equals plus minus root k over m a. Pulling out that a squared, I have a 1 minus cosine squared, which is sine squared. Square root of that is sine of omega t. So that is our v sub x. It's an oscillating quantity. X went with the cosine, V goes with the sine. 
we can actually take the minus sign in this case, leave both up there for the moment. In our case, it'll be the minus sign. But now we compare back to this because we've discovered what omega is dynamically. Okay, if we compare this omega a and this root k over m a, right, the sign just tells us how it oscillates, we find that omega is equal to root k over m. And now we have the complete description. We have the complete description of everything uh, with the oscillatory motion. So I'm going to summarize it now. Summarize it and then discuss it some more. Okay. So summarizing. In fact, I'll, this will be the complete subject of it. So I'll even draw my picture here. Right, I've got my mass on the spring. And what I've found is, is that um, the force in the spring is equal to minus kx. We know that. Mass times acceleration minus kx. And we have now found the solution x of t equal to a cosine root k over m t. And just for good measure, I could add a phase. Arbitrary phase, but you can completely ignore that if you want. This would be formally the, the entire answer. Arbitrary phase. For us, it was zero when we started releasing it from rest. Uh, alpha equals zero when we're released from rest the way we did. So that x of t, a cos k over m t, v of t, or v sub x, of t is equal to minus root k over m a sine omega t. Now there's a great homework problem. With what I've done here, you can also figure out what the acceleration is. Remember, position, velocity, what is the acceleration? Um, but I'll complete this summary. Period of oscillation, so frequency, now there's what's called the angular frequency, omega is root k over m. Okay, that's the angular frequency. The frequency f, I'll, I'll be redundant here, frequency f is equal to omega over 2 pi. Okay. Omega over 2 pi equals 1 over 2 pi root k over m period. Period, we always go omega t equals 2 pi T equals 2 pi over omega equals 2 pi root m over k. So everything up everything is up here now. I'm going to consult the clock. Okay, good. So yeah, this is the entire subject of oscillations in a nutshell. Let's um, talk about the period here first.
two pi, we can say it's formal. We're not worried about that. The relation here is the square root. A little more square root. Look at it's the square root of mass divided by spring constant. So now I'm going to go back to our demonstration. And we can count them out this time. One, two, three, four. Okay. Those times between one, two, three, four, those were the period. Okay. Now suppose I add a lot of mass. Now the mass is greater. The period should be greater because it's a longer time, and sure enough, the fact that it's going slower means the period is greater. Okay. So there's that. Now I'm not going to put different springs on. Remember, my picture I just have one spring. So when you have more than one spring, you say there's an effective spring constant. These springs don't compress. The one in the picture here, the idea is if I push it to the left, it pushes forward. Okay. So formally, it's the same thing. It's a K that belongs to both of these. And if I had a stiffer spring, which I don't have around here, it would uh, oscillate that much faster. One thing I can do is just hold it in the middle. It doesn't work as well for, well, it kind of works. If you hold a spring in the middle, you effectively make it stiffer. But the uh, point is now, if k gets larger and larger, then it's in the denominator, t gets smaller. Okay. And other than that, you have these inverse relations. So I, I try to remember this and this, okay, omega t equals 2 pi, because we always need that. And then everything else is just falling in the Okay, good. So let's see, we have very important x is a cos omega t. And once more, they're just the simple form. You know, x equals a cosine omega t. Let's go ahead and graph that. You have that stuff, cool. Let's get rid of it here. So the harmonic oscillation, it's this sinusoidal function, cosine and sine. You know, cosine and sines are just phase shifted, same function otherwise. So we want to remind ourselves what the graph looks like. So we'll just title this harmonic oscillation. <laughs> x equals a cos omega t. So we have to have a t and an x axis. Now this a is the amplitude. So we know that the motion goes between a and minus a. We're going to start cosine omega t when t is equal to 0. Cosine is just 1. We start right here, and we'll, we know the periodicity of the cosine. So when we draw that, we're going to come through here, back up here. So that's one period. Do another one, and it'll repeat itself. So yeah. should have been a little better, but we'll, we'll, we'll live with that. So yeah, what's the period? So as a complete repetition, we could have gone from here to here, from the beginning to there. So t is that time right there. And of course, omega t is 2 pi, so omega is 2 pi. Hold on, I wanted to solve for t. So t is 2 pi over omega. So this goes on indefinitely. Uh, that's the frequency. 
and this point here will also be implied by, by omega. Okay. So that is about as much as we're going to do. Yeah, I'll give you a little to work on. This should have been smoother, right? Freehand drawing. I will remind us, though, what we started with. So this is the harmonic oscillation. It's a very specific oscillation. The interesting thing about the period here, you know, there's our formula, is that it's independent of the amplitude. So if I make the amplitude a certain degree here and release it, you count these out. Count out the seconds on the video, and then I do it at twice the distance. It's actually going to have the exactly the same frequency, even though the amplitude has been increased. I'll do the experiment again. You guys can verify this. So we do it with a one amplitude, and we get that period, which you can calculate. And then we double the amplitude. And you do this with a stopwatch, you'll see you're getting the same period. Okay. Finally, returning to the pendulum, which we're going to study next time. Next time we'll do talk about the pendulum and talk about waves. The pendulum had small amplitudes, and that's an example of it has the same law here. It'll be A cosine omega t, but the omega will no longer be root k over m. Right? The omega of oh, root k over m will no longer be that. It will depend on the length of the pendulum. So good, we'll talk about that next time. I'm going to leave us with a couple of recommended homework problems. These aren't being turned in anymore, but they're highly recommended. So let's see what we have here. Chapter 13, 1, 4, 10, 20, 33. Uh, next one. Okay, good. See you guys next time.